chapter and battle it out in one of the wildest games of the season. And the crew have gone from the hardest working team in the league to one of its elite. We'll profile the Hard Hats resurgence next on Extra Time. We entered the second to the last week of the regular season with two playoff spots available. By Saturday, they were both gobbled up. Welcome to this week's MLS Extra Time. I'm Rob Stone. He's Dave Durr. Glad you could make us a part of your Monday night television viewing. And let the old playoff positioning battles commence, huh? Well, at least in the last two weekends, we know our eight teams. But more critical right now, San Jose and L.A., New York and Columbus need home field. It's going to be critical in this tight of a race. As we enter the week, Chicago is on top of the overall league standings, followed by Miami and San Jose. L.A. was just one point behind the Western leading Quakes. The crew in fifth place, three ahead of the Metro Stars. Dallas and Kansas City held the seventh and eighth spots, respectively, with only D.C. United having a chance to bump them from the playoff ranks. We begin our coverage with an Eastern encounter Friday in the Meadowlands as the Metro Stars hosted a Revolution Club playing playing for what right now? Well, New England, easy. L.A. playing in the Open Cup final. That's going to be a long time off. You need one way to prepare, and a lot of guys playing for jobs next year. New York, on the other hand, needs some momentum, and they've been horrible on the road this year. They need home field advantage. Yeah, speaking of bad on the road, the Revolution have been woeful. Just one win away from Foxborough Stadium all year. Oh, it's very important. You know, we have to, uh, we still have a chance to be in the top four. Um, we need to play hard and uh, continue to play off, play that way in the playoffs. It's very important. Metro Stars got huge momentum early. Fifth minute off the Daniel Hernandez corner. Rodrigo Faria heads it in. 1-0 Metro Stars. Faria doing a great job coming away from the goal this time. Bad jump by Fernandez. And the rookie quietly having a solid season. 14th minute, New England would respond. Andy Williams, great finish. His third of the year, we're tied at ones. I love this goal, Rob. Look at the way he baits the defender. Whoop. Side netting, far post, stole your whoop there. Hey, that's my whoop. You can't be taking my whoop. Williams, slim down and playing better. New England still pressurizing. Matt Oko collects the loose ball, rips one. Tim Howard there to parry the side. On the ensuing corner kick. Howard would see more activity. Cleared out. Drops to Joey Franchino. Rips one. Tim Howard tips it off the post and then corrals it inside his box. He's been covering the goal all season. Nice touch off the crossbar. 27th minute. Peter Villegas. Look at the time he has to serve this. And guess what? Faria, his second courtesy of his noggin. Metro Stars back on top. Right about now we're figuring somebody ought to cover this guy as he splits the defense wide open once again. Still in the first half, 34th minute. Faria looking for three. Just off target. Late first half, off the corner kick. Adolfo Valencia, that's right. All three Metro Star goals, courtesy of the header. What's important here is you watch three New England players all point at each other and all ball watching. An easy one from New York as they pass it around the box. And the home team up 3-1 at the break. Guys, one more goal would put this game away. For us, one more goal for them puts us in a difficult position. So let's make sure that we are the ones that go out there by pressing, getting another goal, and put this thing to bed. All right? Let's go. Let's go. 70th minute, Braden Cloutier streaking through. Orlando Perez kind of clips him up. We have a free kick, and Kate's been dangerous all year with these, Dave. Yeah, he's looking for the far post here as he's been bending him over the wall. Timmy Howard knew it, though. Going up for 90, Howard had a beat on it. In the 81st minute, New England trying desperately to make this a one-goal game. Mauricio Wright's header over the crossbar. And that kind of sums up the Revs' year. New England drops to 0, 12, and 3 when giving up the opening goal, while the Metro Stars improved to 8, 1, and 1 versus Eastern opponents. Rodrigo Faria has quietly put together a very impressive year for the Metro Stars. He has now tied Josh Wolf and Jeff Cunningham for most goals as a rookie with eight. Need just two more points to tie the rookie record for most points in a season held by Clint Mathis with 20. And the Metro Stars 5-1-1 one, and one when Faria scores. And not much attention was paid to the Brazilian in the beginning of the season, but quietly he's suddenly making this rookie of the year race very interesting. Well, you know, getting close to the end of the season, we're looking at rookie of the year. If you'd asked me earlier, Ryan Suarez from Dallas, Definitely a shoe-in once Jim Curtin went to the bench from Chicago. But now, Rodrigo Faria, you can't pass up the statistics he's had, the big goal. He's out playing a lot of the bigger names on his team. Yeah, with Valencia not producing, a lot of it has fallen on Faria. Well, you know, Dave, 
almost as much as you. I, I too, do enjoy a rainy night. And we had a doozy in South Florida. But was it enough to drown out this guy's talents? Miami, D.C., when we return. They say that nothing remains constant except change itself. At New York Life, we see the world a little differently. The values with which we started, financial strength, integrity, and humanity remain the unshakable foundation of the company today. And we don't see them changing, ever, is why New York Life is the company we keep. How you doing? 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 How you doing?
time, anything to the side in this weather's a goal. So 2-0 fusion at the brink. DC comes out of locker room, responds. There's Mark Lisi, courtesy of a nice deflection. It's a 2-1 game. Really a nice setup by Marco Echeverry. Do what he does best. A little back heel. Mark Lisi just making sure it's on the frame. The same thing he should have done the first time. It's in the back of the net and he likes it. Yeah, good deception by El Diablo there. Chris Henderson down the left side. Chips it. Shaq Cohen volleys it. Nice save by Mark Simpson. A little later, Precky. He's going to cut to his left. He does. Ian Wode in his first playing time with the Fusion Drills one. Simpson stones him. You like that in your first game if you get that kind of time to shoot the ball. 70th minute. More from Precky. Yeah, he's cutting left. He's... Oh! Suckered him in. Shaq Cohen. Meg Simpson. He's got a hat trick. The last time it was Eddie Pope. This time it's a nice cutback by Precky. And it's Kerry Talley that comes over. Leads Chacon wide open once again. The lesson to be learned here. Don't leave Chacon open, guys. Abdul Thompson Conte trying to make things happen for D.C. Down the side. Centers it. A.J. Wood. Tyrone Marshall collide. And Tyrone stays down in pain. And that's a fire down below. Yeah, the man. Magic spray heals off. Tyrone limped off, but yeah, if the spray worked, he'd be back on. Shaq Cohen looking for four. Pings it off the post. Shaq Cohen, what a great game. Marco Echeverri, a gutsy season, fighting through a nasty toe injury all year. Miami officially eliminates Deets United. Chris Henderson extended his point-scoring streak to five games. Fusion, they conclude their regular season with road games this week at the Meadowlands and in D.C. What a season it has been for Chacon. He's now broken the Fusion single-season goal-scoring record. His five-game goal streak is a new team record, and he's the second player in team history to get a hat trick. But you see, goal-wise, he's kind of hot, cold, hot, cold, and then really hot in August and September. A lot of talk about Miami has been Hudson and Serna and Rooney, Precky. But quietly, Chacon has put together an MVP caliber season. Well, you know, I remember talking to the coaches in preseason, and they could all see some improvement in Miami. I mean, they noticed the difference in Bishop, Henderson, and Precky had made. But what was unusual, looking back on it now, is really they weren't sure about Chacon. Did you ever ask yourself, where did this player come from? Like some kind of alien, they seem to go under everyone's radar. No player better describes this feeling than Miami's Alex Pineda Chacon. Chacon came via Honduras powerhouse Olympia, but in preseason, while he was on trial in Miami, no other teams were in fear of what he brought to the Fusion. In typical Ray Hudson fashion, he had a feel for this 31-year-old that no one else seemed to have. Talked about as too old and out of favor at Olympia, his move to MLS was as sneaky as his move up the scoring leader charts. Chacon brings all the things you expect from a top international talent. He has a great first touch, he moves well off the ball, and he's an assassin in the box. But what's more impressive is his ability to find seams in the defense. His attributes are like his coaches, a feel for the game that other forwards have rarely shown in MLS. Chacon is like E.T., that little alien from the movies. Although he doesn't look imposing when the fusion bicycle seems to be riding in a traffic jam, he makes it fly over. He has the ability to make you forget him, and when you lose concentration, he punishes you. In fact, one of the biggest reasons for the Fusion's success is that his coach recognized a craftiness and wit many others overlook. His ability to hide among the defense might be the biggest reason other coaches didn't know about him in preseason, but one thing's for sure, you can bet everybody knows about him now. I also really like the fact that you don't hear anything about this guy off the field. When I asked Ray about his off-the-field personality, he describes him with words like gentleman, classy, and intelligent. These are the same words he used to describe him when he's playing. You add 19 goals and 9 assists to that, and you get the kind of allocation that will make any coach or GM look like a genius. A guy who's kind of similar this year in Colorado. John Spencer. Yeah, absolutely. Same kind of adjectives used, same kind of goal production. Great pickup by both Colorado Just and Just a little Miami. more personality there. Yeah. Well, up next, Dallas and Chicago in a game for the ages. Plus, Dave Durr puts on his journalistic cap and expounds on the rivalry between these two clubs. Somewhere out there, your team is taking the ice. And you can be there, coast to coast. Now, Sports in Demand brings your team home. With NHL Center Ice on digital cable, you can choose from up to 35 out-of-market games a week. Call now to lock in your $20 early bird discount. You can either fly to a different city every night or pocket the airfare and get NHL Center Ice. The clock is ticking on your 20 bucks. Call now. Guys, if you want to...
to change your life around, make lots more money than you need to check with Buddy's Carpet. We're training men now to install floor covering, carpet, vinyl, ceramic, laminates, huge pay, tons of benefits. There is you, you won't be sorry. You got a buddy in the carpet business. Tomorrow on ESPN, ESPN's two-minute drill finals, followed by the Nike U.S. Women's Cup as Japan faces the USA and Sports Center at 11. On ESPN2, RPM Tonight and NFL Tonight at their new time, 6 and 6.30, and later Sports Century Profiles controversial linebacker Ray Lewis. And on ESPN Classic, a tribute to Reuben Hurricane Carter with a Sports Century Profile and then two of his greatest fights and catch the new 24-hour ESPN News. Welcome back to MLS Extra Time. The burn, the fire, the pyromaniac special. It's a rivalry that you've seen up close and personal the past three years. Well, I really have. And when you talk about great rivalries in this country, you think of the Cowboys, Redskins, the NFL, or maybe the Lakers, Celtics in the NBA. But just to put it in perspective, if you multiply that times 10, you get the passion of 100 years of great soccer rivalries, which have developed outside this country. The neat thing is, in a league that's only six years old, we're having the chance to witness history being made, and there's one rivalry we'll be talking about for years to come. To find the best rivalry in MLS, you might not go farther than the Midwest, where one rivalry already has the heat of a championship, historic playoff and open cup battles, and has recently finished with the suspensions and casualties of a war, which show the passion of any great contest. To say that Dallas and Chicago take the Open Cup seriously would be an understatement. In Dallas before the season, they had only won it or lost the eventual champion since they joined the contest, while in Chicago, they have won two Open Cup titles out of the last three. In 1997, it was Dallas winning the title from D.C., and in 98, it was D.C.'s old assistant, Bob Bradley, knocking Dallas out in a last-minute thriller. In 99, it was Chicago in defense of MLS Cup, and Dallas knocked them out with a come-from-behind victory. This marks the only time that the Burn and Fire have met in the playoffs, and it is often talked about as the best game in league history. There are also plenty of side stories that have fueled the fire. Take your pick from Chicago's hatred of Graziani, Francis Ocaro even stated to the press that he was once one of the dirtiest players in the league, or Dallas's equal disdain towards Dima Kovalenko for breaking Brandon Pollard's leg, which many Burn fans still feel cost them MLS Cup 99. Just in case you think this year would be different, consider the fact that Lubos Kubik was often the most hated of the fire for an elbow he threw to Mickey Trotman. His move to Dallas along with Chicago's old assistant Mike Jeffries would have you thinking things would lighten up between these two. Instead this season, the rivalry has advanced to bench-clearing brawls and overtimes where you can feel the passion in the stands and know anything is possible. Enough passion that this is the only rivalry to have a separate trophy aptly named the Brimstone Cup awarded by the fans for the seasonal head-to-head -head winner. In the end, what sets this rivalry apart is not some forced conference or PR battle, but the passion that goes with history. A passion that has crept into the stands and added a brimstone cup to a story that we'll be talking about for a long time. And this season, the club split their first two games, both going into overtime. Interesting note, if the season ended right before kickoff of their Saturday confrontation in Chicago, this would be a first-round playoff preview matchup, and this one definitely had the feel of a playoff game. Season high, 24,866 on hand for this one. Fans from both Dallas and the Fire on hand to partake in this storied rivalry. It's crazy fans with both teams, but obviously that's uh, what makes it a, a great rivalry. And I think Dallas and Chicago are lucky to have uh, uh, real loyal fans, and they've got something going, and uh, uh, it's a pretty good thing. So I haven't given a lot of thought to who we play or are working out different scenarios. I think uh, preparation for this week was strictly trying to get ready for Chicago, and I think that's the, the attitude the team takes into this game. Early on, fire captain Peter Novak at midfield. Down the cut of the field he goes and unleashes a wicked lefty shot just off frame. I can't tell you how many times I've seen that. Peter Novak made one of those padded runs beating six burn defenders. Well, we talked about the rivalry between these two clubs, and it is intense. Witness this altercation in the corner. Ryan Suarez and Ate Razov really mixing it up. This call really kind of the lesser of two evils. You can take Razov's pull on the shirt, you can take the tomahawk chop by Ryan Suarez. You don't know which way to go on this one. Suarez ready to give it a go. Ante the vet kind of walking away and getting in his shots behind the ref's back, if you will. Both received yellow cards. 
late stages of the first half. Lubos Kubik, long ball. Finds Richard Ferris. Playing kind of a right midfielder role in this game. Serves up the cross. Chad Deering up from the back line. Heads it down, but Zach Thornton all over it. Nice shot by Richard Ferris getting the serve in on a rope perfectly to Chad Deering's head. So leg three of this year's Brimstone Cup goes to the locker room tied at zero. As fast as we can. We need Richard and Paul trying to get a little more involved and a little more involved wide. All right, and let's try and keep Jason and Ariel central, okay? Tend to kind of drift wide and end up in Richard's space, end up in Paul's space, okay? Keep those guys, the two front runners, a little more central, all right? And we can play off of them. This crowd would see arguably the best second half of MLS action this year. Scary moment here. Demarcus Beasley, Lubos Kubik. Ouch. That is a nasty collision. When I watched his full speed, I think Kubik just takes him out. Then we got the advantage of replay. And when you see it in slow motion, he catches him with the forearm. And then I'm thinking maybe he's just faking the head injury so the referee doesn't give him a card. But when you see the third view, it looks like they do knock heads. Both of them coming away with dangerous injuries. Demarcus certainly got the worst of that one as he's stretchered off the field. His parents drove down from Fort Wayne, Indiana, and they're there to keep an eye as well as big brother Jamar on DeMarcus Moore and his situation later. Eric Winalda would come in to replace him. Still scoreless, 68th minute. Diego Gutierrez, good run down the left side. Thinks about serving it up. It gets away from him and then really gets away from Nat Jordan. 1-0 fire. Bang, bang. Gutierrez is first of the year. Well, I'm sure Diego Gutierrez doesn't think so, but what a terrible way to get a goal in a game this good. Credit Dallas if this goal doesn't let the air out of their balloon. Gutierrez eyeing Razov, but instead he has the game's first goal. Dallas would try and respond. Jorge Rodriguez. Jason Christ, one-time lefty volley, Zach Thornton swallows it up. 81st minute. David Vaudrill, Peter Novak at midfield. Peter Novak, Peter Novak, Peter Novak, Peter Novak, Peter Novak, Peter Novak. 2-0 fire, great individual effort. Well, we talked about it earlier, but what another one of those great patented runs from Peter Novak. And if you look closer here, you've got to watch Chad Deering. He thinks the defense is going to step over. He just lets him go by. No one takes the ball. An easy goal for Novak. So nine minutes of regulation left in the fire. Yeah, they got this one wrapped up. Uh-uh. 86 minutes. Oscar Perea, double team, very deep. Gets off the cross. Jason Christ, the dummy. Bobby Ryan smacks it home. It's a one-goal game. You can tell this ball really surprised Chicago, too, Rob. Oscar Perea doing a great job of just finding a way around two players. Almost looks like Bocanegra stops here, and he gets the serve in. Jason Christ sucks curtain over. Bobby Ryan finishes it off. Now, stoppage time in the second half. Rodriguez floats it. Ariel Graziani is there, not once, but twice. Crosses the line. We're tied at twos. And that's the second time you saw two Chicago players going to Graziani, losing their man. This time, Vaudreau plays it back with a nice setup. Graziani finds a way to stick it in. So this game would continue. Novak down the right side. Antonio Martinez bumps him off. Resulting free kick. Watch the far post activity. Ate Razov right there. How'd he miss it? But he gets slammed into the bar. More on that in a moment because here comes Dallas looking for the win. The quick outlet to Martinez. Down the left side he goes. Cuts. Spins. Plays it to Pareja. Jason Christ and Zach Thornton. Two-foot tackle in the box. Jason saying, good gracious, Zach, you almost killed me. But Razov still down in the goal. Here's what happened. This is a nice bump by Darius. He clears out Winola, goes to the back post. I think this goes in if Ante doesn't touch it. But Dave's pulling him down. He just gets a toe. It goes easy to Matt Jordan. And as you can see, as Dave's pulling him down, he kind of backs his head right into the back goal post. And you actually see the goal frame kind of move on his collision. Ante carted off, taken to the hospital for a CAT scan. Andrew Lewis comes in in his place. And this wild affair ends tied at twos. All three regular season meetings this year between these two clubs have gone to overtime. Each club with the win, and then this tie to so the Brimstone Cup series.
Series after three legs is tied with the point, though. The Fire solidify home field advantage throughout the entire postseason. Every time we play Chicago, it's always a physical game, and and uh, tonight was no different. You know, uh, it's always a crazy game between uh, between the two of, uh, two of these teams. But uh, it's just it's always wild. Well, all this talk about rivalries and this one didn't let us down. But what a great game. And really, if you look at it, this is probably the best game all season I've seen Dallas play. They really competed for 90 minutes. Can be a big boost going into the playoff. I want to update Beasley's and Razov's condition for you. DeMarcus suffered a mild left shoulder separation. Will practice with the team tomorrow. Listed questionable for Saturday's game in Dallas. He had a CAT scan. It was negative, as was Ante Razov's. But Ante will be reevaluated by a neurosurgeon tomorrow in Chicago. Kansas City has backed their way into the playoffs, which is fine, but Tony Miola is not a happy camper right now. The Wizards have stumbled lately, allowing 10 goals in their last four games. They're up next versus San Jose. We're not next to Pepsi. Sure. Into the 
15-yard box and a solid piece of defensive work by Robin Fraser to eliminate the scoring chance. L.A. then with the corner kick, Simon Elliott and in-swinger Adam Fry. But Scott Garlick is there for one of his three saves on the night. 57th minute, Richie Koch out for Colorado. Out races Fry, takes the shot, spilled by Hardman, the follow by Bravo. But hold everything, no goal. Paul Bravo judged to be in an offside position. Richie Koch out certainly can't believe it from that angle. Look at Paul Bravo, very, very close. Credit Bravo, though, for following his shot, but the score remains 1-0 L.A. Now, nine minutes from time, Valderrama with the corner kick, sent out by Alex Bengard to Jason Moore. Moore, given time, lifts the ball into the box for Raul Diaz-Arce, nearly the equalizer for the Rapids. Third minute, second half stoppage time, Sasha Victorine for the Galaxy, sends it into space for Alex Bengard. Bengard then takes it wide, just trying to waste time, calmly plays the return to Victorine. Given space, Victorine picks out Adam Fry. Fry makes the run into the 18-yard box, assesses his options, finds an unmarked Peter Vianis, it's 2-0 Galaxy. Third goal of the season for Peter Vianis as Fry records his second assist. Bad defensive breakdown in their own penalty area by Colorado as Scott Garlick was given little chance on the shot by Vianis. L.A. now has five wins in their last six MLS matches to claim top spot in the Western Division. Firmly in place is the Galaxy's starting keeper, Kevin Hartman, records his fourth shutout of the season. Both Jeff Vegas and Landon Donovan starting on the bench before the second largest crowd in Kansas City history. We begin in the fifth minute. Ronnie Eklund dispossesses carries of Vagnon, pushes forward in the attack, plays a beautiful ball to Junior Agogo, lines up the shot, and Tony Miola is there. The rebound then sent out by Mike Burns. Miola would be tested often in this game. 28th minute, Matt McEwen plays it long to Chris Klein. Klein then finds Roy Lassiter, whose shot is just deflected wide by Zach Gibson. Second shot of the game for Casey, nearly resulting in the opening goal of the night. Six minutes later, Manny Lagos in a foot race with Nick Garcia. Lagos keeps his composure, gets off the shot, and again, Tony Miola comes up big, a total of five first-half shots for the Earthquakes. 36 minutes, throw in for the Wizards. Gary Glasgow gives it to Chris Klein, heads for space. Glasgow to the byline, finds Roy Lassiter, 1-0 KC. Team leading seventh goal of the year for the Lakes' all-time leading scorer, Roy Lassiter putting the Wizards up. 44th minute, Lassiter wins the header in front of Ian Russell. The two go down, and the scrap is on. Roy Lassiter and Ian Russell continue to go at it. In steps the referee, Terry Vaughn, to restore order. Lassiter with the left hand. Both players would receive yellow cards for the minor altercation, but would stay in the game. To the 60th minute, Matt McEwen to Chris Klein plays the return, and McEwen shot cleared off the line by Zach Gibson for his second big defensive play. 66th minute, Chris Brown to Chris Klein spots Andrew Gregor. Gregor gets Gets off this shot, saved by Conway, follows the rebound, can't finish from the tough angle. One minute later, Ronald Cerritos flicks on the Lagos, then Ramiro Corrales, and again Tony Miola makes the key save for the Kansas City Wizards. 69th minute, Manny Lagos elbows Nick Garcia behind the play, and that's a straight red card for Manny Lagos. Now with the man advantage, Casey tries to capitalize. Lassiter to Andrew Greger, and John Conway makes his best save of the night. Andrew Greger nearly scores his first goal of the season, but Kansas City holds on for the 1-0 win, ending both a two-match losing streak and two-match scoreless streak as they defeat the Earthquakes for the first time this year. Hard to get a real good gauge on this Kansas City team lately. One week they're getting shut out, the next they're doing the shutting out. What do you make of their playoff chances? Well, Rob, Kansas City knows clearly they're not the team that won MLS Cup 2000, but they think if they have a solid defensive effort, if Tony Miola stays in good form and stays healthy, they can make a serious run at a second cup. Yeah, and are we going to see uh, Mr. Mo Johnson back in time? Mo Johnson is resting the neck injury. I think he will be available for the playoffs. What he has left, well, that remains to be seen. And that would be a big plus for them if he can come. Thanks, Sean. We appreciate it. Well, at the beginning of the season, they were given up for dead, but the crew have made an amazing turnaround. Now the Ohio side is riding their new groove into the postseason. Uh, we're having a great time. Uh, anytime you're on a roll like we are and, and we're playing um, together like we are, it's, it's so much fun to, to train every day, to play in the games. Um, it just makes playing soccer so enjoyable. Oh, how you doing, Mama? Oh, how you doing? 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 How you doing?
for a championship. The organization has been thirsty, and the, and the community has been thirsty. So for it to be in our own backyard on October 21st, it, it would be a dream come true for us, for everyone involved with the crew, and all the, everyone that supported us over the last six years. coaching change the crew's numbers have been well documented but they still catch your eye 12 4 and 4 since andrulis took over including a 10 game home on beaten streak at 45 points the club has equaled their club record and they still have two more left to go Dave what are some of the things you like about Greg Andrew? Well, there's really a couple things. What I like most is the fact that he was intelligent and confident enough not to fix things that didn't need to be fixed right. on this team. Any other coach in the league, and you're making wholesale changes on this unit. Instead, he concentrated on confidence of the team and the atmosphere. Sunday, the crew looked to sneak up into the fourth playoff spot, a feat they would achieve if they could knock off the Tampa Bay News. Greg Andrewis and his crew down south in Tampa to take off Perry Vanderbeck and the Mutiny. Fifth minute. University of South Florida product Jeff Cunningham back in his old digs. What an effort from 25 yards out. Aiden Brown, a great save to tip it over the bar. And if there's a highlight for Tampa this season, it's the play of Aiden Brown since he's come over from Colorado. Josh Keller trying to create some offense. Dragged down from behind by Teddy Wabonsu, and he sees yellow. Move to the 23rd minute. Jair floats it over the top. The rookie, Devin Barclay, first touch is a poke over Tom Presses. He's got his third of the year, and the mutiny up 1-0. Well, it shows the rookies are learning something this year. How about this composure from Devin Barkley? Nice finish. And Devin would create some more chaos, if you will. Down the right side, the cross. Gus Cartes, got to do better than that. When you're looking for a job for next season, you got to finish that off. 29th minute, Brian West to Brian Mazenoff. His first touch, outside of the right boot. bang -o. we're tied at once. His eighth of the campaign. What a beautiful piece of skill by Mays. You don't see this too often out of the midfield. Outside of the right boot, just bends it around the goalkeeper. 40th minute, what a great give and go between John Wilmar Perez, Jeff Cunningham, making it look easy. Two unanswered goals for the crew. They're back on top. Oh, first he eats his lunch, then he drinks his water that's awful man insult to injury stealing your water come on Aiden you got to defend that Aquafina this is great skill and tight space nice little combination the lift by Cunningham nicely done move to the 59th minute Dante Washington onside Aiden Brown one save Brian West stone at the goal line Steve Trich you finally gets it out of there I love this what more can I do goalie look Rob late stages Tampa trying to equalize the service Big Mama off the bench, heads it down though, right at Tom Prestis. So on Mamadou Diallo bobblehead day in Tampa Bay, it's Brian Mazenoff and the crew walking out of Raymond James Stadium with a W. The crew now seven wins in their last ten encounters. The mutiny are woeful at home. For more on this game, here's Jack Edwards and Ty Keogh. Well, Rob, a couple of weeks ago, an MLS coach said to me, Columbus scares me in the playoffs, and it's easy to see why. They have athletic and fast players who can help you at every position on the field. Well, if you go from back to front, they're very solid. Tom Prestes has gained a lot of confidence in goal this season. In front of him, an experienced defense, especially the leadership of their captain, Mike Clark. Then you go into midfield, which I think is the overall strength of the Columbus crew. The creativity of John Wilmer Perez, the good two-way play of Brian Mazenoff, backed up by John Hart's Robert Varzia, and then a very balanced attack. Speed up front, Jeff Cunningham. Him, playing with so much confidence, his one-on-one -on -one abilities. Brian West out on the flank. Dante Washington. They have quite a list of players that can put away goals. With two games to go, they are tied for fourth overall. And if they get home field in the first round, they're going to be dangerous. They carry an 11-game unbeaten streak into the final weekend of the season in games played at Columbus Crew Stadium. Send it back to Rob. Thank you, guys. With one week left in the regular season, here's how the standings appear. Miami, Chicago tied on points, but the tiebreaker goes to the Fusion. L.A. now in third as the Western leaders, but they could finish anywhere from first to sixth. The crew have the tiebreaker advantage over San Jose, hence they sit in fourth. KC Dallas flip-flop seven and eight. Hypothetically speaking, if the postseason would begin today, here's your four first-round pairings. Miami would host Dallas. The defending champs would be in Chicago. West Coast, East Coast between Galaxy, Metro Stars, and the crew would host the Quakes. This last week will decide several teams' postseason 
tickets and destinations, home field may be more important this year than it has been in the past. Well, you know, in the past, if it was a tight game, that was a lot of times the difference between going on or going home. This year, with one through six that tight, it's going to be more important. Kansas City, very busy this week. Outside of MLS action, Copa America Norte continues. Wednesday, they're in Lima, Peru, to duel Sporting Crystal in their third Group C matchup. They currently sit in third. New York off until October 17th. Costa Rica. U.S. trying to pull within one. Preck 
Mikey in the 79th minute rips a free kick just off target. I know he'd like to have this one back. Adding a good spark, trying to get the U.S. back in the game. Gets all of it just wide. Bruce Arena and his boys bumming in Costa Rica. And that is all she wrote. As the Tico Ticos qualify for their first World Cup since 1990, the U.S. has now dropped three straight World Cup qualifiers, two of those on the road. Honduras and Mexico won on Wednesday, so both teams elevated themselves over the U.S. Mexico sits in third because of a favorable goal differential. Not all, though, is lost for the States. Should they win their final two qualifiers, they will advance to World Cup 2002. And both of those games can be seen live on ABC Sports. Up first, home battle with Jamaica. And then the States head south to Port of Spain, Trinidad, to take on TNT in November. Ariel Graziani did not learn his dance moves from Danny Terrio, but he still likes to cut a rug. Did the burn striker make our plays of the week? Find out when we return. Years, 11 
seven months and six days last Saturday overtakes Lothar Mateus as the oldest player to ever play in an MLS game. This is Jeff Bradley for MLS Extra Time. Thank you, Jeff. He has five multi-goal games, eight multi-point games, and now four Player of the Week honors. The Fusion's Alex Pineda Chacon is your Player of the Week, courtesy of his hat-trick Saturday versus D.C. His 47 points leads the league, and the Fusion are 10-2-1 when the All-Star finds net. Now the Got Milk, Got Five, Plays of the Week.